Hello, and welcome to Highway, which this week comes from Bishop Stortford. Something I noticed straight away about the town was the number of schools. And of course, where you have schools, you have young people. the lads and some of the girls of Bishop Stortford College. Bishop Stortford is one of those East Anglian towns which mixes the medieval and the modern in partnership. It's not always a comfortable partnership, if only because some of the older Stortfordians have had to face up to some rapid changes. There was once a time when the vicar of Stortford decided that he didn't wish to live in the vicarage, but preferred instead this rather grander residence on the outskirts of town. That man was the father of Cecil Rhodes, Stortford's most famous citizen, the man who founded Rhodesia. The vicarage, meanwhile, which nestles protected by the great spire of St. Michael's Church, was turned into a school, the foundation of the great tradition of education in Bishop Stortford. Now, 130 years later, things are back to normal. The present vicar is Canon John Richardson. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Nice to Lovely see you. Lovely to see you. And you. Now, the, obviously, the, the church dominates the town physically, but does it dominate the town spiritually as well? Well, I think it does in a way. If you look at that huge, great building up there, it's been there for 500 years. It's massive, and it's got a huge, great tower and spa. And it was built by people who said, really, God is important in this place. And perhaps we don't notice it at the moment because we're too busy and there are other buildings. But 500 years ago, the old medieval ploughman would look at it and say, there's St. Michael's, and it's important. And you see its great big tower, and that stands for me for God present among his people and the eternal values which I think are all important. I see my job as trying, as a parish priest, to proclaim the things of God, which I believe are important, but also to be part of a family and to help build a family where love and affirming and hope can be found. And I think if you came into the church, you'd be surprised how lively it is. <laughs> sure I would. And of course, the, the church and the schools, the education, that's, the, that's a tie up there too here, isn't there? That's Bishop right. Stortford. Bishop Storford seems to be full of children. And when I moved here 18 months ago, 
I thought there were nothing but children in schools. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it so happens in our congregation, as in many other congregations, there are lots and lots of children. This is the way So it is that every Wednesday morning at 10.30, a throng of mums and their toddlers come to St Michael's for their very own church service. John Richardson told me he considers that the family is at the very root of Christianity, and that the church is, in its own way, the family home. Maybe that's why they keep streaming in. This is the way we say our prayers, say our prayers, say our prayers. This is the way we say our prayers, the way we say our prayers. Is there anybody first who wants to say thank you for the birth of a new baby? New right. baby? No, Katrina, I don't think so. <laughs> right, let's start to sing the songs. All right, now we're going to sing The Wise Man. You all need two fists. You've got two fists. The, the wise, wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the rain came tumbling down. And the rain came down, and the floods went whoosh. The rain came down, and the floods went whoosh. The rain came down, and the floods went whoosh. And the house on the rock stood firm. And the house on the rock stood firm. It's very easy to dismiss children's songs. But what John Richardson was doing was to build the foundations of these children's lives upon rock. So the houses will stand firm for many years. And the rain came down and the floods went whoosh! The rain came down and the floods went whoosh! The rain came down and the floods went whoosh! And the house on the sun fell. A lot of young families have come to Bishop Stortford in recent years. As a town, it has much to offer. It's barely an hour's travel from the centre of London, and yet still retains the feeling of a small country town. You can see the way in which it's expanded by working out when the various houses on the outskirts were built. Maybe the schools have had something to do with it as well. There are plenty to choose from, and that's a privilege parents should always enjoy. I visited St. Michael's Primary School, where Bert Bayford is the headmaster. Bert, as the headmaster of a diocesan school, do you feel you have a religious obligation towards the pupils? Oh, yes, um, we do, Harry. We have very close links with St. Michael's Church. Um, we were founded something like 150 years ago, in the early 19th century, uh, by the church and a group of parishioners for the education of all the children in the parish. And since that time, over those years, we've had very close links with the church. Uh, the vicar, John Richardson, is chairman of our governors, and he comes to school each week to take assemblies. A lot of our children probably had their first experience of, of worship and going to church at St. Michael's Tiny Tots. I think parents choose a church school for, well, many reasons, a variety of reasons. Um, some because it is a church school, and I think others that probably doesn't apply. But uh, one thing I think they all expect is that we will reinforce the moral teaching that they give their children at home. Because I think the home, the family, is the greatest influence on the way a child develops, the way their character and their attitudes develop. But we can reinforce that. If you think that moral teaching and religious education are very closely linked because morals are about um, right and wrong and the way we treat each other. And religious education is about relationships, our relationships one with another, love thy neighbour, our relationships with God and our relationships with the whole of, of God's creation. So I, yes, I think um, religion and moral teaching have a very important part to play in our children's education. Thanks very much, Bert. Now, let's take a look at the school, shall we? Let's do that. In the classroom, I felt it was good to know that the children were working to an overall plan conceived by a headmaster as thoughtful as Bert Bayford. I also discovered, to my surprise, that they had a visitor for the day. 
Helen Shapiro. Helen, how's he meeting you here? Well, Harry! <laughs> Hi. Do you feel nostalgic about coming back to school? Well, not really, but it's nice to see the kids and it's nice to see all the lovely paintings they do. It is, isn't it? Ever fancy yourself as a teacher? No, not really, except maybe if there are any budding pop singers here, maybe I could teach them to sing. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Let the world sing today A song of peace that echoes on And never goes away I'd like to build the world a home And furnish it with love Grow apple trees and hearts no white turtle doves I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony I'd like to hold it in my arms and keep it company I'd like to see the world for once all standing hand in hand and I hear them echo through the hills for peace sing today a song of peace that echoes on and never goes away so put your hand in my hand let's begin today put your hand in my hand help me find the way put your hand in my hand let's School kids come in all shapes and sizes, and Bishop Stortford High School takes boys up to A-level. It's a school with a fine reputation, and Andrew Thompson is in his third year in the upper school. His mum has worked there for some years as a school secretary. Together they form just one half of a rather special family I had the good fortune to meet in what you might think were perfectly ordinary circumstances. I've been invited to supper with the Thompson family. Nothing remarkable about that, you might think. But it's quite a privilege because this meal is a little ceremony which takes place every day of their lives. That's right, isn't it, Rosemary? Yes, I think we've done it almost, you know, when the children were quite small. Sort of dad comes in from work and we always try to have our meal together, even if it's just for half an hour. And of course it's a time when you can get together and discuss family problems or family triumphs or yes. tragedies or whatever. Yes. That's right. Well, we found in the sort of last six months, we've had sort of two bereavements. My dad died, and then four weeks later, Peter lost his mum. But it was, it was lovely because we've always been able to get together and share sort of, you know, if we felt a bit sad, we could cry together even, but also say, do you remember when? And um, I think we've always found that we'd, we'd like to get together and uh, talk over, even if it's just trivia. Because you, you've left home, Julia, now, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. I'm now working up in Manchester. Yeah. Do you miss those, these get-togethers, then? Yes, I do in a way, because when I sort of go home from work, there isn't sort of mum and dad and brother to sort of sit down and have a good moan to. <laughs> <laughs> so they listen to your problems, or even if you're just sort of eating just to meet them. That, that is the trouble, isn't it? I mean, in, in a lot of households, because um, one parent is away. That's right. The, the, in today's world, as we know, the uh, female of the house sometimes comes in and says to the children, well, I'm very sorry, you'll have to get the meal yourself. The microwave is in. Yeah. Ten years ago, it was traditional that the mother 
always had the meal on the table. And I think that probably that's the reason why there are broken families today, mainly because they ignore or tend to forget that the children still need the family environment around the meal table. It's very important. Yes, I think so. Yeah. I think actually being a working mother makes me feel that it is even more important. I mean, I do strive to sort of make sure that we all do meet. Um, I mean, sometimes if I've sort of forgotten about what we're going to have for the meal, it's a quick scrabble through the freezer. But at least when we all sort of sit down, we have a meal together and we can talk. And I think communication is so important. Julia, do you think now when, when, when you leave, when you have a family room, will you carry on this tradition, do you think? Yeah, I think so, because it's a way of keeping together if you're leading busy lives. You can sort of express your opinions, whether you have a moan or whether you're just sort of having a joke about what's happened during your day. That's very good, isn't it? <laughs> and, and of course, Andrew, it, it, you can't sulk then, can There's no place you can sulk. No, I mean, because... <laughs> <laughs> Because um, when I, I come home from school and I do, my, do a bit of my homework and then it's a break for me when it's tea time and then I can talk about either if it's been a really bad day at school where the teachers have been going on at me or something <laughs> or it's been a really good day when I've been doing well. Now, Peter, eating together as a family, does that strengthen your Christian faith, do you think? Well, I think it does because um, as a family we are a Christian family and we worship together in the local St Michael's Parish Church and uh, as parents, we hope that our children will still enjoy our faith in the Christian life. Yeah. And so I passed a contented evening with the Thompson family. I gained a very strong impression of a group of people prepared to unite their faith with their everyday lives. A family who between them and guided by the parents had decided upon a course of action and had the courage to stick to it. There's somebody else from nearby with the courage of her convictions, and that's Shirley Williams. I think our young people today, our own kids, face a whole series of very difficult moral choices. They're surrounded by temptations like using drugs so that you escape from really nasty uh, circumstances and issues that confront you. They're confronted with violence all around them in the streets, films and images of violence, and some of them attempt to use violence themselves. They're confronted with the temptations of casual sex, which becomes more and more risky now that we all know about AIDS. And it's not just that they're faced with as individuals, it's not just what our boys and girls see when they have to decide about themselves. It's also, I find, that an awful lot of them are very conscious of the dangers that face the whole planet, this little shrinking earth that we live on. They're aware of the dangers of environmental pollution, the way in which the forests are dying, the way in which our skies are becoming poisoned, the way in which our water is getting more and more dirty and they don't like it. They want to fight against it. Now, all those are moral questions. They're some of the most important questions we'll ever have to deal with. And I find it very odd that we shouldn't discuss these things at the very center of the curriculum in our schools. I think they should be taught on the basis of our own beliefs, of our ethics. And we should never forget when we talk about these problems, which are moral problems, that Christ himself taught in parables. So I think that when parents and children sit down and consider these matters, and I hope they'll consider them very much together, like I hope I've done with my own kids. Then I think one of the things that you do is to talk through these things, to try to bring out what you believe in, to try to bring out your values. For most of us, those will be Christian values. For some people, they'll be Hindu or Muslim or Jewish values. And we have to respect those values too, because they are the religions of many of our fellow citizens today. So Bishop Stortford, with all his schools and his young families, had taught me something about the way in which we should treat our young people. There's a special relationship between parents and teachers and the young folk they're bringing forward into life. If I learnt anything, it was when the Reverend John Richardson showed me that the two can, with faith, work together. Bishop Stortford, like so many of the places I visit on highway, yielded up the key to one small but significant part of our lives through its people. People like the headmaster of Bishop Stortford College, who is charged every day with forming young characters for the future. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. However much confidence, self-discipline, knowledge we may acquire with the help and support and encouragement of our family, and school, it will all mean very little without that most important ingredient of all, love or caring. 
at the end of the story of Pooh Sticks in A. A. Milne's The House at Pooh Corner. Pooh and Piglet and Christopher Robin are standing on the bridge looking down at the river below them. Piglet remarks that Tigger, who was the cause of all the commotion, is all right, really. Pooh thinks for a long moment, and then he says, I think everyone's all right, really, but I don't suppose I'm right. Well, he may have been a bear of very little brain, but I think he hit upon the most important and timeless truth of all. And now we'll sing the hymn on your sheets at the name of Jesus. Well, that's the end of Highway for this week. 